As a young salesman, I had a very serious self-image problem. I was in direct sales for 14 years. I cannot begin to tell you the number of times I would get out to knock on doors, and that literally is what I was doing. I would have a prospect right here, another prospect next door, and another prospect 20 miles down the highway. I would call on this one prospect, and then instead of going next door, I would drive 20 miles down the highway to see the other one. I had to plan what I was going to say. I would rationalize if I'd had the right approach, I would have been able to have gotten in this house and sold them. I was rejected here, therefore I was not ready to go next door. I used the excuse that I was planning what I was going to say. The reality is I could not handle another rejection that quickly. That simply meant that I had a poor self-image. Now, I use the word rejection very deliberately because a lot of people use that word and think along those lines. Had I understood something that Fred Smith talks about in his book, You and Your Network, then I would have been much more successful much earlier in my sales career. Fred says that when people are rude and reject you, what they're really doing is not rejecting you personally. He says that that is not a rejection, it is a business refusal. And they would have refused anyone else. It's not you, it has nothing to do with you. He also says that when people are downright ugly to you, it is not in most cases because they want to hurt you. It is because they themselves are hurting you. And if we can understand that, it enables us to deal with those people a lot more effectively and deal with ourselves a lot more effectively. As a young salesman, on many occasions, I have gotten up to go sell, and instead I would go see prospects or customers whom I'd already sold. I had to service their equipment one more time. And what I was doing is very simple. I was procrastinating. I'd go by the grocery store and get the baby a quart of milk, although the refrigerator was overflowing with milk already. I'd hear a little click, 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 uh, or a bump, bump, bump in that left front tire. I'd go get it checked at the service station. I mean, I didn't want to get off way out in the country and have tire trouble and couldn't get back to town. All of those are simply manifestations of a poor self-image. My friend Chris Hegarty, who's one of the outstanding sales trainers in America, says that 63% of all sales interviews end with no attempt to close the sale. The salesperson talks and talks and talks. They hope that the prospect will finally say, okay, I'll take it. Then they will not have to lay their precious ego out on the line. The best way they can avoid being rejected is never to ask for the order. And some salespeople get very clever in doing exactly that. That's one reason you'll find a lot of salespeople in the movie theater in the afternoons. Now, you might wonder how I know they're in the theater in the afternoons. I saw them there. That's how I know <laughs> they're there in the afternoons. These things are simply uh, manifestations of a poor self-image. We need to understand, therefore, what is the difference between refusal and rejection. Now, my son understands that very clearly. When he would ask me for something as a child and I said no, he didn't feel the least bit rejected. He just felt like his dad had missed the question. He didn't get upset with me. He'd wait about five minutes and give me a chance to correct an obvious mistake. <laughs> That's what we need to do is understand it's not a rejection when somebody turns down a request. Whether it is for a promotion, whether it's for a raise or whatever, it is a business decision in most cases that they're making. We need to handle it as such. But a lot of deserving people don't get raises or promotions because they don't know how to ask for them. They ask for them with the wrong attitude, with a chip on the shoulder, which is an indication of wood up above, 
They do not really approach it because they have felt rejected themselves. They expect another turn down and in their minds it is a rejection. And so we need to understand that. When we are refused the raise, or if the employer says, yes, of course we're happy. A lot of people don't ask for raises because they, in their minds, don't see themselves as getting one. When they ask for one, if they say yes, then that's what you went in for. If they say no or maybe, then you don't get upset about it. You simply say, well, I'm sure you have a reason, logically and from a business perspective, as to why you're saying no at this time. Would you share with me what your reason is, number one? And number two, what can I do to earn the right to this raise or this promotion? What can I do to make your job easier, this company more productive and more profitable? Now, I guarantee you when you take it in that light, your chances are going to be dramatically enhanced. The way you see you, is very, very, very important. Also, the way you see your value to the company might be dramatically different from the way the boss sees it. We need to look at both perspectives. My friend Bill Gove, who has been a professional speaker for many, 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 many years, tells a story about this fellow who was on trial for his life. He had been accused and charged with killing somebody and stuffing him in a suitcase and trying to ship him across the border into Mexico. He was caught in the process, and his lawyer was pleading his case. He said, I know, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what some of you might think. I know what the law thinks. They think of my client as a cold-blooded, heartless, murderous killer. He said, the truth is, he was only caught because the thumb of the victim was sticking out of the suitcase. You see him as a murderer. I see him as a lousy packer. <laughs> the perspective can be quite different. Now, why do we need to know what the uh, manifestations are of a poor self-image? When we recognize them, we can deal with them. I'll probably say that at least three times before we're through. A person with a poor self-image cannot accept a compliment. You say to that individual, oh, I just love that dress, they'll come back, this old thing? My, that's a beautiful suit you have on. Well, I got it in a basement sale. That chicken really is delicious. Well, it should have been marinated a little bit longer. My, that was a beautiful report you turned in. Well, I wish I'd had a little longer to get it ready. If they had just told me earlier, I would have. They cannot accept a sincere compliment. A simple thank you is all that is necessary. It would make everyone feel a lot better. Poor self-image manifests itself in the way we handle our personal lives. You tell a youngster with a poor self-image that he ought to stay away from drugs, they'll kill you. And his response, at least internally, many times is, don't tell me that. My friends tell me that they make you feel good, make you feel big. Besides, suppose they're not good for me. What difference does it make? I'm a nothing. I'm a nobody. Got nothing to lose. A person with a good self-image would not respond in any such manner. You tell a youngster study for his lessons and obey the law if he's got a poor self-image, many times they're so negative they say it won't do me any good. You know, the deck's already stacked. I came the wrong side of the tracks. The rich kids are going to get all of their breaks. Why shouldn't I have a little fun right now? You'd say to a youngster with a poor self-image, you really ought to save yourself for marriage. And their instant thinking is, Who's going to marry me? What chance have I got? Why not I have a little fun now? That's what it's all about. My peer group tells me I've got to do these things to be accepted. Since I have nothing to lose, why not go ahead? An individual with a poor self-image is jealous without cause. Now, I'm not talking about jealousy for cause. Ladies, if he comes in smelling like joy and lipstick all over his collar, 
Uh, jealousy is not a manifestation of a poor self-image. That has nothing to do with it. But some people say, you know, oh, I just love him so much I can't let him out of my sight. Or I just love her so much I don't want her out of my sight. What they're really saying is I don't understand why this person married me in the first place. I certainly do not deserve him or her. A jealous, critical nature is one of the manifestations of a poor self-image. They can't handle constructive criticism, much less criticism itself. One of the interesting manifestations of a poor self-image is old motor mouth. We once had one who worked for us. Now there's a guy that if you ask him what time it was, he would tell you how to build a clock. I mean, literally, you have seen people who are like that. You know, they corner you or they come visiting you and they start talking and they talk and they talk. I mean, incessantly they talk. And finally, you persuade them that it's time for them to leave or else they give you some indications that they're going to leave. And they get to the front door and they open the door and they uh, talk another five minutes there in the door. And if you happen to have visited their house and you're trying to leave, they follow you all the way out to the car. And as you're backing out, they're signaling you to roll down the window. They got one more thing they want to tell you. I see some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. The class clown is a typical example of an individual with a poor self-image. They come in a couple of minutes late, you know, and distract everything. Oh, have you already started the class, Miss Brown? Oh, did we have any assignment today? They're people who feel they cannot attract any attention on their own. Therefore, they got to make a show of that nature. Now, on the other end of the scales, on occasion, the quiet ones also have a poor self-image. They don't think they've got anything at all to offer. They read somewhere that still water runs deep and that it is better to remain silent and let people think you're not smart than it is to speak up and let everybody know that you're not smart. So they, a lot of times, the very quiet ones, but let me stress that in the case of the class cut up, the motor mouth are the quiet ones. The key word is that could be the manifestation of a poor self-image. Not always. If a person exhibits any of these three characteristics, he does not necessarily have a poor self-image, but the odds are pretty good that he does. I mention this because if any of these characteristics describe you, the identification process will encourage you to take the necessary step so that you can do something about it. If they describe any of your friends, associates, or relatives, it will enable you to recognize them and be able to be of assistance to them. One of the manifestations of a poor self-image is a lack of commitment. People don't set goals. You see, they figure this. If I make a commitment, if I set a goal, if I say that I'm going to do this, and then it doesn't work out, then what that does is it further destroys my self-image. Therefore, if I don't make the commitment, then there's no way I can fail at the project. Negative people, as I said earlier, seldom are very persistent because they simply do not believe they can accomplish any objectives. Of course, self-image is manifested a lot of times, particularly in the way we treat people in a subservient position. One of the things that bothers me the most is when I see someone abuse another individual who cannot defend themselves. For example, a waiter or waitress in many cases cannot properly defend themselves. Somebody who is in a position of a shipping clerk or a file clerk or somebody you know who really is at an interest level position, they cannot properly defend themselves. I think the most irritated I've ever been with anybody is one day an associate of mine abused my secretary. Not the one I have now, this was years before that. That was most unfair and completely uncalled for. If he wants to fight, he should fight with me. I can fight back, but she was not in position to fight back. A person who will do that, you can just put your last penny on it. There's an individual who really has a distorted sense of values and who also does have a poor self-image. 
A lot of times a new employee with a poor self-image will come in and make some unrealistic promises about what they can do. The new coach sometimes does exactly the same thing. A lot of kids with poor self-images always insist on picking up the tab for the coach. The buddies get together, you know. They don't deserve to be friends with anybody on their own merit, but if I pick up the tab for the Cokes, then, you know, I'm a good guy, and they'll accept me as part of the group, and I'll be invited back in. It used to bother me before I got into this years and years ago when I was in sales management. I would watch salespeople who I knew were broke. If it hadn't cost but 50 cents to go around the world, they couldn't have gotten out of sight. And yet I have seen some of them absolutely insist on picking up the tab every time the group went out anywhere. They did not feel that they could be accepted on their own. Sometimes poor self-image is manifested in our uh, penchant for cleanliness. You will see a household executive you know, you visit them and you have a cup of coffee and when you sit the cup back down in the saucer, if a little coffee is spilled out, they'll immediately get a napkin to take care of that. They clean up the ashtrays before you finish smoking the first cigarette. I mean, that kind of an individual. I heard about this one lady who was so fastidious that when her husband got up to go to the bathroom in the evening, she had the bed made when he got back. That's kind of overdoing it, I believe, and it does indicate something. One of the uh, manifestations of a poor self-image is the parent who will never discipline their child. They fear that the child will withhold its love from them. And they just love them so much, they say, that they cannot do any disciplining. What that really means is that they don't completely love the child. They have such a fear that they will lose that love, that they will do just about anything to keep that from happening. The tragedy is that in that process, they damage the relationship, they damage the child, and they damage that child's future. The parent who truly has a good self-image understands that real love demands that they do for the child what is best for the child. A student who will not properly question the teacher about a grade or report could have a poor self-image. Now, there are ways to do it. You don't go up and stomp your foot and demand, how come I got this C? I deserve a B. But rather, you go up very quietly and say, I was certainly disappointed in my grade. Now, I wonder if you would explain to me what I need to do to bring it up, because I honestly thought it would be higher this time. Would you mind going over with me why the grade is not the B instead of the C? I've never seen a responsible teacher who would not respond positively to it. Now, the manifestation with the greatest long-range impact on our children, as far as self-image is concerned, occurs in the preteen or very early teenage years. When the child who has this poor self-image, who does not have a lot of friends, who one day realizes that Johnny and Mary are different, that boys and girls are different. Johnny meets Mary, and Johnny has been rejected in his mind all of his life. Mary's been rejected all of her life in her eyes, and now they discover each other. And they discover that chemistry is in more places than in the laboratory. And they kind of latch on to each other. For the first time, they find somebody who loves them just for themselves. And a very volatile situation is underway. That's one of the reasons the study done by Concerned Women for America shows something that is rather intriguing. Here's what they discovered. Girls who start dating at 12, the odds are five to one, that by the time they graduate from high school, they will be in a sexual relationship. Girls who start dating at age 16, the odds are five to one that they will not be involved in a sexual relationship by the time they finish high school. Very significant. 
The parent's self-image, therefore, will play a major role in the way they deal with their child. Because how many times does a child come home with incredible pressure and want to start dating? All of her classmates are going out. I so well remember when our oldest daughter started putting the pressure on us with tear-stained eyes. She said, but Daddy, all of the good boys will be gone. I mean, she was just as serious about that as she could possibly be. I am so delighted that uh, we were able to persuade her uh, that all of the good boys would not be gone by the time she got to be 16 years old. I remember another occasion uh, she came in and she wanted to go to such and such a place with such and such a group. And I said, uh, well, of course you can't go. And she said, well, why? She started to cloud up, you know. And I said, well, there are two basic reasons for it. It's the wrong group at the wrong place. She used the standard one on me that every parent here with teenagers have heard about 4,000 times. But daddy, everybody else is going. I kind of smiled. I said, now, sweetheart, come on. You know, perfectly good and well, that's no reason for you to go. She said, well, why can't I go? And I said, well, it's the wrong place and the wrong crowd. And I want to tell you something. These are friends of yours right now. They might not even be speaking to you a year from the day. Five years from the day, you might not even remember their names. But I'm your daddy. And regardless of what you do, a year from now or 10 years from now or 50 years from now, I'm still going to love you too much or as much as I do today. And today I love you too much to let you put your reputation on the line by going to a place that is not in your best interest. She paused there for just a moment and then she almost literally jumped forward, hugged me and kissed me and said, thank you, Daddy. I didn't want to go anyhow. <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? I don't know what she told her buddies when she went back out there. But she might have said to them, well, my daddy won't let me go anywhere. He won't let me do anything. That doesn't make any difference. I believe that she was ahead of the game because of it. And I believe that we were ahead of the game because we would not let her do that. Self-image is so important. I want to read something here that is so important that I didn't want to take a chance on just verbalizing it and not communicating exactly what I wanted to say. The person with a poor self-image doesn't move successfully into management. He fears rejection by the people over him, under him, or around him. He often steps out of character and dons one of four ill-fitting masks. He tries to be good old Joe and assures his subordinates that nothing has changed. He desperately tries to be one of the gang. Second, in his fear of rejection by his former peers, he makes concessions and exceptions that go beyond the principles of good management. Sometimes he does the opposite and takes an arrogant, I have arrived approach, which causes resentment among his former peers. Third, he may be unduly concerned about his relationship with management, and in his anxiety to please, he becomes too servile, eats too much humble pie, and seeks too much advice. He has an exaggerated fear of failure because he sees his worth in terms of never failing. Ironically, this fear of failure causes him to hesitate too long before taking any action. This unrealistic hesitancy is often the cause of failure. Fourth, the manager with a poor self-image may assume a know-it-all attitude seek advice from no one, and set out to show everyone that he knows how to run the ship. A poor self-image is manifested in every walk of life. Even good old Joe, or Josie, have the problem, which is a common one and is no respecter of age, sex, education, size, or skin color. He has the I must be a nice guy and never offend anyone kind of a self-image syndrome. And listen. As a youngster, 
He smokes cigarettes he doesn't want, takes the drink he doesn't like, laughs at dirty jokes that actually offend him, joins the gang he secretly dislikes, and goes along with illegal or immoral conduct, and participates in a dress code he secretly abhors. All because he has never accepted himself and is terribly concerned that if he asserts himself and crosses his peer group, he will not have any friends. As an adult, he has a tendency to tell people only what he thinks they want to hear. He would never send an overcooked steak back to the kitchen. He even gives up his place in the barbershop, lets others take his parking spot, or even crash the line in front of him. He doesn't argue with the boss nor object when a co-worker takes credit for work he has done. Now don't misunderstand. If you are Joe and your self-image is so healthy, you can conduct yourself in this manner because this is what you want, that's okay. If you view these incidents as minor or small stuff that mean nothing in your game plan for life, then your self-image is in excellent shape. However, if you do these things to gain acceptance, you're gaining everything but acceptance. The reason is simple. You are not presenting the real you. In fact, you're presenting a phony, and most people, including other phonies, don't like a phony.